Hi, Dr. Jackson. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. It hasn't been too long. Just a couple of days ago, we were um, on a call together during our Park Equity webinar that was co-hosted by the Prevention Institute and C Solutions. Um, and we were delighted to have you on for that. You know, it's such an important issue. It was a pleasure to be there. We really appreciate it. Um, and now, just a couple of days later, here we are recording our coffee chat for the month of November 2020. And a lot has happened this month. We just saw a highly anticipated election. And with the election of Joe Biden, there's been a lot of discussion about how the US is going to move forward on climate. It is all over the news. And obviously, you were the director of the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health. You're very familiar with public health policy and action. You know, with all of this talk on what's next, we want to highlight in this discussion um, the communities that are already feeling the negative impacts of climate change. So at this moment of change and opportunity, what do you anticipate as being the opportunities and the barriers to promoting climate health and equity? It is so important given the, frankly, almost catastrophe that we're dealing with, the short-term one being COVID, the secondary one being immense levels of unemployment people really struggling to pay their bills and to go about their lives. Um, and the third one being climate, which seems remote and trivial, but is a much more powerful threat than even COVID, which is hard to imagine. But when you know, at CDC, we had the Refugee and International Health Group and famine kills huge numbers of people. Floods are the biggest killers in the world. And so we're looking at a very different world and always, always, always it's the poor and it's the people that are disenfranchised of color and of color who bear the greatest brunt from these changes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we, going back to the uh, Park Equity webinar that we just mentioned, you know, uh, we talked about our recent, recent joint research that demonstrated the impact that parks can have on life expectancy and the role that they play in minimizing health disparities. How do we use and build on research like this in order to advocate for equitable policies and practices that are good for health and for the climate? You know, I think the tool that was developed at UCLA, Dr. Jarrett and his group, allows people to look at survival and health impacts and a whole string of things that come together that make life very difficult for a lot of people and look at it in a very fine grain layer, almost a pixel layer, so that people can say, wait a minute, my block is really affected. Uh, our neighborhood, people don't know about census tracts, but we need our leaders to really speak up to our needs. And that's very powerful because all, you know, Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. Well, all public health, all environmental health is local. Yeah, absolutely. I hear people say all the time, I can't wait to get back to normal. And the problem in the United States is one year ago, 2019 was not normal. Mm -hmm. Poor people are really hurting. Our, we've got the most storms, hurricanes in the history of the United States at this point. So there's so many things that we should not be going back to. And this is a chance to really think about it and get it right. And bringing data to the table is an important way to do that. And that's what this study around parks is. And, you know, parks aren't going to fix all of our problems, but they sure make life for people that are disadvantaged a lot easier and better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, during the, during the webinar, we also talked about how you can't just do one intervention, right? Parks are not, you know, a, a one and done solution. You have to also include park maintenance. You have to include safety for the community. You have to, you know, address houselessness. So how, um, you know, how do we coordinate between these adaptation policies and these public health policies? This goes to the core of public health's identity. And when I teach, I say the purpose of public health is to assure, can assure conditions where people can be healthy. And where I'm going with that is there are a lot of specialists that have to come together. Uh, the water experts, the arborists, the tree experts, the frankly, the police and people that assure public safety, the naturalists. And one of the th strengths of public health is by focusing on the well-being of the community, of children, on the elderly, on the poor, people with disabilities, 
we span many domains and we have genuine authority if we show up at the meeting. And so when we show up at these meetings, don't let somebody tell us, go away, you don't know anything about um, urban river parkway design. We've got to be there speaking to human health. Absolutely. And I think that that is actually making a really strong case for the toolkit that Prevention Institute actually just um, published around this park equity work. It includes case studies about community groups that have already done advocacy work for parks in their communities. It includes all of the research that people would need in order to effectively communicate the benefits that parks pose for communities. So, um, <laughs> you know, I feel like this is you know, that's a perfect use case for that lesson that you're really, really getting at. And it's not, we don't want to be the health people that are arrogant and show up and order people around. This is not about imperialism. This is about really cooperating, collaborating, and building the connections that are more powerful than any individual group alone. And it's one of the, frankly, the powers of the Prevention Institute that I admire so much. Yeah, it's been a really incredible honor to partner with them. Now, I am curious to get your take on sort of what the difficulties and what the you know challenges might be doing this work moving forward, we have um, you know a cultural moment right now where pol policy may shift towards addressing climate. How how do we make sure that we don't lose that momentum? In order to get out of the terrible recession we are in right now and people's savings being depleted, the United States government's going to have to step up uh, late term, but we're gonna have to print a lot of money. We're, and that's how we got out of the last terrible recession depression. And that money needs to go to really empower folks that um, and get people back to work, give them meaningful work. Franklin Roosevelt dealing with the depression in 1933, one of the major things they put forward was the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Mm -hmm. That put a lot of, frankly, urban boys, it was all boys, it was mostly white, but it doesn't have to be that way by any means, but really put people to work doing meaningful work and building the physical environment, which in the process builds the cultural and social and trust environment at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Great. Well, do you have any sort of lessons or words of advice as we move into 2021, as we look at policies and, you know, try to try to implement change in our own communities? This is going to be unpopular. One of the problems, and we've done a lot of work on it, particularly when I was at CDC uh, with elevating environmental health and community uh, empowerment. And one of the things communities have, communities have to do and the participants have to do is figure out how to consolidate their messages. Because if the political leader has 19 people coming in with 19 different ideas, they're entitled to do nothing. And so the dialogue process within the community to say, you know, I didn't get what I wanted, but I was convinced that this is the number one thing you should do first as we get the money to rebuild or to reemploy or to do something. Mm -hmm. And so I, this dialogue has to go on now because there will be funding coming forward to do this. And so we, we, it's important we not waste this time, we not lose the opportunity. These opportunities close and you won't get another chance probably in my lifetime and maybe not even in yours. So we have to get it right. Wow, that is um, certainly a call to action if I've ever heard one. <laughs> well, I really appreciate your time and thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your experiences and uh, words of wisdom. Yeah, it's a joy to be with you, Lynn. Thank you. Take care.